Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, a show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Lauren, and I'm here today with ICR's geneticist and director of research, Dr. Jeff Tompkins. It's so good to have you here today, Dr. Tompkins. It's great to be here. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about junk DNA, or rather the DNA that many people try to pass off as junk. From my pretty basic knowledge of the topic, only a small portion of any given creature's genome is responsible for coding for proteins. That leaves a lot of DNA left over, and many people try to say that that is completely useless or junk. So where did that idea come from? Well, we have to go back in history to really the the late 1960s to see where that idea came from. So evolutionists began proposing a model called the neutral model of evolution. So this idea basically says that much of the genome is just neutral. It's it's free to evolve and pop out new genes and new sequences that would, you know, provide something for the mystical agent of natural selection to act upon. And so this was before the days of, of DNA sequencing even. So that's where it really got going. Uh, was back then. But then, as scientists began to uh, develop DNA sequencing, which was very crude in in the beginning, uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s, they began discovering that genes, especially in what we would call eukaryotes or or creatures uh, that have a nucleus and have individual chromosomes, they began discovering that genes were in pieces, as they (laughs) originally said. So, you would have a gene, but only certain parts of that would code for protein, and the intervening parts uh, did not. And they, they originally thought, oh, this is junk, and it fit well with the paradigm of neutral evolution. And then as DNA sequencing began to progress, they began discovering even more parts of the genome that did not code for protein. So when we get to the Human Genome Project, which really got going in the 1980s, and is actually still going on today, um, they began discovering that that less than 2% of the entire human genome actually coded for protein. And so that began to fuel the idea of this neutral model of evolution that was begun in the 1960s, and and it seemed to validate it. Mm -hmm. That would seem very validating at first glance, but is all of that DNA, the 98%, is all of that useless? Is it junk? When the first draft of the human genome was produced in 2001, scientists said, look, we've got all this great information, all this DNA sequence. Uh, we can only identify less than, than 2% that, that codes for protein. What is the rest of it doing? And so they started a separate project called the ENCODE project, which stands, it's an acronym, it stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And the ENCODE project received huge amounts of funding, just like the Human Genome Project did. In fact, it was part of the the Human Genome Project that was added on in about roughly 2004. And the first papers that began to be published out of this ENCODE project in 2007 were very shocking. They actually found out that almost the entire human genome was being transcribed or turned into RNA, end to end. In fact, one paper called it a RNA machine. The human genome was Mm -hmm. an RNA machine. And so it looked like the entire human genome was functional. There was RNA being transcribed from one end of it to the other. Just to clarify, can you give us a brief definition of RNA? Yeah, your genome would be like the hard drive of a computer where the information is contained that that basically, you know, runs the system. But when you pull up a program, let's say you're pulling up a word processing program, your computer will actually make a, a copy of that code that's on the hard drive and put it into something called random access memory or RAM. And that's the way the genome operates. Your, your DNA is the hard drive in the nucleus of the cell. And then when genes are required to be turned on, a copy of them is made, like random access memory, so to speak. That RNA is then taken out of the nucleus and, and into the cytoplasm and, 
and some of it codes for protein and, and some of it doesn't. Some of it creates uh, RNA molecules that are used directly by the cell. Um, in fact, some of those RNA molecules may function in the nucleus, some in the cytoplasm, some may even be exported out of the cell and, and transferred around your body in these little lipid capsules. So really the, the, uh, the human genome or any genome for that matter really is an RNA machine. Wow. So it actually fills a very, very crucial role instead of just being there as junk. Oh, exactly. In fact, there was one paper that was published, and they found out that, that all of this RNA that was being transcribed or copied from DNA, much of it was required for chromosome stability. So these RNA molecules would be transcribed, and they would literally form a matrix around the chromosomes, a functional structural matrix that allowed the genome to function, that allowed it to assume a certain RNA or conformational structures. And so that's the thing. RNA is, does so many more things than just code for protein. In fact, one of the interesting things that was discovered in the ENCODE project uh, was that there was over twice as many genes that coded for RNA that was used directly by the cell in some way than there were protein coding genes. Wow. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about human DNA. Is that the same between creatures? What does that look like as far as non-coding DNA portions across different creatures, across species? Well, across animals, you know, the human genome functions in a, in a similar way, especially across different mammals like rabbits and creatures that we're more similar to in our biochemistry. But even in plants, we see the same thing. Hmm. We see genes in pieces, as it were, um, and we see a lot of, of regions of the genome that do not code for protein. They code for functional RNA, or they, or they might have regulatory uh, regions around the genome that don't code for protein as well. So these would be like, say, like a light switch. So when you walk in a room, you flip the light switch, and it turns on the lights. Well, there's a lot of regions in the genome that are basically switches and control regions. In fact, there's millions of them in the human genome that turn off and on things, that tell uh, certain parts of the genome what to do, that turn on genes, that tell the genes how much product or RNA to make, how long to make it, how fast to make it. And so it's, it's very complex what's going on in the genome with all of these regions that do not code for protein that, that were once thought to be junk. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Kind of changing gears just a tiny bit. What about pseudogenes? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, pseudogenes were genes that had similarities to protein coding genes. And scientists at first thought that, that they were junk because they, they didn't code for protein. Mm -hmm. Now we know that Almost every pseudogene that's been studied is actually a functional RNA coding gene. Mm. In fact, many of these pseudogenes produce RNAs that actually regulate the protein coding gene that that pseudogene is similar to. And so pseudogenes are turning out to be very important for, for human health. Um, when there's mutations and problems in certain pseudogenes, it can lead to heart disease and diabetes mm -hmm. and all sorts of different health problems in humans. So pseudogenes are now actually, uh, most of them that, that we have studied are actually functional, what we call long non-coding RNA genes that produce functional RNAs that do really important stuff uh, in your cell. Okay. So we're finding these elements that we thought were just kind of throw away are actually completely crucial for various things that our bodies are doing. That's, yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's amazing. So can you talk a little bit about transposable elements and what that looks like? Well, there's many different types uh, of what's called transposable elements. At first, they were called jumping genes. And so transposable elements uh, are in different categories and, and it can get very complex in trying to explain all of the different categories. So I'll try and make this as simple as I can. Most uh, transposable elements 
are actually not jumping around or doing anything like that. So are people so uh, transposable, meaning it jumps around to a different portion, or what does that? Right. Can you define that a little bit? Yeah, they were first really uh, characterized in corn. And in fact, uh, there was a lady who was very famous, Barbara McClintock, who actually studied these, and she found out that, that these genes would jump around um, and that they would interrupt various parts of the corn genome, which were associated mm. with uh, various aspects of kernel development, including kernel color, I believe, and other things. So that's where it all got going. Okay. But now that we've been doing a lot of DNA sequencing, we've, we've basically uh, uncovered many types of transposable elements, and there's many different categories. As it turns out now, uh, looking at the human genome as an example, most so-called transposable, transposable elements are not jumping around. Mm. They're actually control features of the genome. They have switches and other important things within them that are doing uh, stuff to keep your genome healthy and functioning. So, But there are parts of the genome that do jump around. And actually, there's genome rearrangements as it were, that occur during development. So in other words, when a young baby is developing in the womb, the genome is actually in certain tissues being sliced and diced and moved around in a very controlled uh, manner. It's an it's a engineered system that God put in the genome. And we're only beginning to just really understand what's, what's going on with that. It occurs in a number of different uh, uh, other mammals and plants, and it looks like there is a feature in the genome that, that actually is able to, to move things around um, and position them for, for whatever purpose that, that's required. And a lot of it typically has been found to be associated with development or the development of a young baby or the development of, of neurological tissue and things like that. Okay. That's amazing. We are very fearfully and wonderfully made. No, exactly. So if you're thinking along the lines of evolutionary theory, then over that long of a period of time, all of that non-coding DNA would be mutating, evolving. Right. Do we see that happening? No, we really don't. Because when we compare, uh, say, different types of mammals and their genomes, a lot of these regulatory elements that are non-coding uh, are very similar between these creatures. And so they're not showing any signs of evolution. It's mm -hmm. just common code serving a common purpose, just like a computer programmer would use. And so I actually have had to do computer programming in my research. And when I create a new computer program to do something, I don't create a whole bunch of, of new code most of the time. <laughs> I borrow code from other programs. Right, it already exists. Right, it yeah. already exists. And so I just put it together into a new system. Mm -hmm. Now, definitely creatures have their own unique DNA. So humans have DNA besides the common elements that do common things between, say, mammals. But humans also have their own unique uh, repertoire of, of DNA sequences as well that are regulatory protein coding in the various types and in categories of DNA that there is. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you for touching on that. So over the last couple of decades, humanity has increased a lot in our knowledge on genomics and also with advances in technology, it's made it a lot easier to study this subject. So what do you think, you've touched a little bit on this already, but what do you think just the top takeaways are? What are the most important things that we've discovered about genomics, especially in pertaining to junk DNA here in the last couple of decades? Well, I think one of the most important things we've discovered is the immense functionality of the genome from one end of it to the other. So there are not regions that are just sitting there neutrally evolving, neutrally mutating. It's just not happening. In fact, many scientists now are, are realizing this, and it's creating a huge problem for evolution because the entire genome now is appearing to be functional. Mm. And areas that, that were thought to be junk, when mutations develop in those areas, it can lead to serious problems. Say, in, in the human genome, it can lead to cancer, diabetes, heart disease, various you know ailments like that. We've talked a lot about some technical information about genomics and... 
DNA sequencing and all of that. I just want to bring it in a little bit because you've used some interesting words like coding, um, orderly rearrangement, and even just seeing the efficiency where every aspect of DNA is being used in a very real way. How does that point to our creator? So this whole idea of the genome being a system of, of systems debunks evolution because it all had to be put together all at once for it to work, just like a computer has to be put together all at once for it to work, or an automobile or a washing machine. The genome had to be put together for it to function all at once, which included all these different categories of DNA that we've talked about. Now evolution would say that the genome would have evolved bit by bit over long periods of time. But that just doesn't work because we know that it is irreducibly complex beyond our wildest imagination. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tompkins. Um, you've really filled this topic out a lot for us and helped us to understand just how the glory of our Creator can be seen in the order and intentionality that we see in DNA. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you. And to all of our viewers and listeners, thank you again for tuning in. You can find the Creation Podcast on Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else that you access to your podcasts. Again, I'm Lauren, and we'll see you next time on the Creation Podcast.